Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? So, A, B, C. Oh, no, no. Okay. I've, I've actually planned something. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for inviting me back again. I really, really greatly appreciate it. Am I okay on, on, yeah, I um I always say to Doug, I usually don't need a microphone because my voice carries, as he will tell you. Um, so if you remember, uh, or for those of you who heard me speak last time, I shared that I have a German heritage, which means that I'm organized, structured, methodical, organized, structured, methodical, and Doug can tell you that. Um, so when you asked me to come back and speak, I thought, hmm, I can't just speak about something totally different. I have to make it a series of some kind, all right? I have to have some kind of order and structure. And um, so if you remember, my first talk that I gave was called uh, Magnificent Obsession. And the reason I called it that was because the, the idea was that the obsession we should have in our lives is being uniquely who we are and sharing our gifts with the world. That should totally be our obsession. Um, and I've always been um, really struck by that, that everyone is so unique and individual and different in a society that wants us to conform and be someone else, um, have different talents and traits. And um, by sharing the gifts that you have, that you uniquely have, you change the world. Whether you think you're doing a small thing or not, you're changing the world. And so I thought about that topic and I thought, okay, how could I build a series on that? And so I came up with a, a title for a series and this will be episode two of the series and I'm calling it this, how to be more like you when they want you to be more like them. And so we're going to have episode two now. So episode two. Um, so let's face it, as wonderful as you are and as unique as you are, there are people out there who are not going to be receptive to your gifts. In fact, people who specifically say things that annoy you, contradict you, dispute you, argue with you, and otherwise just are annoying, right? Right. We're all going to face that. Everyone is not going to love us all the time. So I titled the talk today, Drama. <laughs> and now it's not just drama. It's drama with an exclamation point, okay? Drama, because that's what we find ourselves embroiled in so much day to day, is drama that takes us away from the center and the loving kindness that we have within us. Um, now, you may remember last time I referenced a song because music is very important to, to me. And my favorite song of all time is Running Up That Hill by Kate Bush, who has just experienced a resurgence due to her popularity from the show Stranger Things. Um, and I reflected on that after the talk because music is just an amazing medium, right? Whether it's the chords or the tone or the lyrics or what it reminds you of in the past, music can just transform you. And it's just amazing to me how we all have different types of music that really speak to our soul. Um, and it can really transport us to other places. So as I was uh, thinking about today, of course, there is a song that popped into my mind. And uh, I will reference a band that both Doug and I love quite a bit. In fact, we had concert tickets to see this uh, group and it got canceled because of COVID uh, back in the beginning. Um, it's a band called Erasure. And uh, they are really, who's heard of Erasure? Anyone heard of them? They're really fun, upbeat. They're a dance group. In, uh, if you ever wanna see Doug dance and bust a move, put Erasure on, cause he will dance like nobody's business. Um, so they wrote a song called Drama with an exclamation point, which inspired me for this talk. And uh, incidentally, it's off their album, which is called Wild with an exclamation point. So obviously they like their punctuation. But here is some lyrics from the song Drama that I really loved. <clears throat> they go like this. One rule for us, for you, another 
do unto yourself as you see fit for your brother, is that not really within your realm of understanding? Well, then your shame is never ending one psychological drama after another. And I just loved that. Love this idea that so much of the drama and angst comes from the fact that we can't open our minds and share the thoughts and understand where other people are coming from. And we know those people, right? We all have those people in our lives, the drama queens, the people that are gonna argue with us, the people that we just kind of butt heads with. Um, and I'm sure you can all think of other words that you might like to use. And we have to realize that while there are those people in our lives, we are those people for others, right? So there is drama that goes on. Um, but remember, this is a part of our series called How to Be More Like You Instead of Being Like Them. Um, so I wanted to talk about these dramas in the context of mindfulness and spirituality and how can we best face those. And um, this is a topic I face a lot. And actually, there's a double entendre here because um, I am involved in drama. I have a part of a drama organization in Highlands, as, as all of you know, and um, it can be filled with drama. It can be really, really interesting to work with that group of people. Now, there was a show last October, you may have heard of it, it was called The Great Pandemic, and there was not a lot of drama associated with that because I wrote it, directed it, produced it, pulled the costumes, cast it, and basically did everything myself without working with anybody. So I wouldn't let there be any drama because I didn't let anyone else in the creative process. Um, but that can't happen all the time. We can't just be our own ship sailing through. We have to learn how to better exist in this world. So in fact, this year, we are producing another play in October. Get a, there's a poster out there, but I brought a copy of my script, which always ends up looking like this after I've studied my lines forever. It's called Night Watch, and it is by a woman named Lucille Fletcher. And I have to say, it is a really, really, really interesting murder, kind of 50s film noir murder mystery. But guess what? Someone else is directing it, someone else is producing it, someone else cast it. And so here's a great example lately where I've experienced a ton of drama, more than I ever thought possible. So as I was reflecting on this, and Doug can tell you it's been a, it's been a drama filled time, um, I came up with my list of how to best manage drama in a spiritual way. So here is my 12-step program for keeping your sanity when the drama hits you as hard as it possibly can. So step one, step one is never react, but respond. This is probably the toughest one of all, and that's why I put it first. We've all gotten those things, right? We've gotten emails that made our blood boil. We've seen a post on Facebook that we just wanted to scream. Um, you know, someone says something to us that just irritates us. And we just, what do we want to do? We want to respond. We want, I mean, we want to react. We want to just contradict. We want to tell them why they're wrong. Instead of taking time to think about it. Now, I have something that I call the 24-hour rule, and that is when something irritates the crap out of me, I will sit down and I'll write a response. I will go outside and talk to a tree. I will rage, but I will not press send or pick up the phone or do anything for 24 hours until I've calmed down. And usually when I go back and read it, I think, whew, I'm so glad I didn't send that because that could have really, really, really ruined a, a relationship. Now, this is even harder when it happens in person. You know, at least when you read an email 
um, from someone, you can, you know, you can sneak away and be angry, but they don't see you. But if it happens in person, face to face, it's really, really, really hard to control yourself. So the other night at rehearsal for Night Watch, there was a uh, fellow actor, and uh, should some of you come see that, I'm not going to say who it is, because I want you to go up and say, boy, you really made Craig angry. Um, <laughs> She was having a hard time with her lines and I felt bad with her. So I was trying to help her. Um, she couldn't remember things. Um, and in, you know, in the theater world, when, you know, if you forget your line on stage, only your fellow actors around can help you, right? So if, if someone forgets their line, um, say the line is, say you were supposed to say, um, I'm coming through the door, right? If you forget that, then I, as your fellow actor, would say, weren't you going to be coming through the door? And it'll trigger their mind to say, I'm coming through the door. So I'm trying to help her. And in the middle of that, she stops. She gets all angry and she points at me. And she said, I would not be having any problems if he didn't get his tenses incorrect. I said at one point, you need to lay down instead of lie down. And she said that was her excuse for not remembering her lines. So my face was just, I smiled. I excused myself immediately and went to the bathroom. And the bathroom was, is you can kind of hear if, if, you know, in there. And so what happened was I was, I was flushing the toilet and screaming while the toilet was running. So no one could hear me. I was like, Flush. Oh, I hate her, I hate her, I hate her. Flush. Oh, I can't believe she did that. So I did that. I got all the angst out and I went back out as difficult as it was. And I smiled throughout the rest of the rehearsal. And I went home and cried on Doug's shoulder. <laughs> now, luckily, after I calmed down, a couple days later, I was able to meet with her rationally talk with her and we mended all the fences. But if I had immediately said what had popped into my mind, I could have potentially ruined that play because she could have left, she could have quit, she could have done anything. So again, this is an, an extreme example, but one of the quotes I wanna give you, and this is a quote that I um, have hanging up in my office because I love it. And it's a Chinese proverb, it goes like this patience in one moment of anger can save you a hundred days of sorrow. I love that. Patience in one moment of anger can save you a hundred days of sorrow. So true. So again, step one on your journey, never react, wait and respond. Okay. That's step number one. Um, Step number two is one that you're all very familiar with, which is um, practice some sort of mindfulness techniques to get you out of your funk. Do something to change your mindset. Um, a lot of times when something happens to us or we feel the drama, we feel the angst, we, uh, you can just dwell on it. Does that ever happen to anyone? Like I'll be driving down the road, like anytime I have to drive to Atlanta, I'll get a bad thought in my mind and I'll just stew. And after two hours, I have come up with the most, you know, despicable plots against people. And so you have to really somehow trick your mind um, to, to, to jar yourself out of this funk. And there's a couple um, that, um, I know that I use when this happens to me. And I think, Ashley, I love the fact that you're doing meditations to start because the breathing in and out with some sort of mantra is one way for me that I really try to do that. You know, take a breath and have something to say on the inhale and something to say on the exhale. So I will usually say, you know, I'm breathing in loving kindness and I'm breathing out fear and anger, breathing in loving kindness, breathing out fear and anger. And by doing that, it kind of naturally just triggers me to get out of this mind space. Any mantra will do, but just the act of that simple breath is a wonderful trigger. Another one is uh, one that my, um, uh, one of my coaches and teachers um, taught me, which I absolutely love. And I've, again, I've shared this with Doug is um, 
if you're in that place, um, say something that will shock you out of it. And the thing she taught me to say is five, four, three, two, one, change. So counting down from five to one lets you kind of process yourself. And then the change, it's kind of like you watch those medical shows when someone's having a heart attack and they do those paddles on them and it shocks them back. The change for me kind of shocks me back into reality. Okay, you know, stop this, let this be done now. So um, I encourage you to use something like that, something that'll just shock you out of that. And for me, that is wonderful because again, the countdown also just allows me a couple of moments to, you know, find, it's almost like it finally is dwindling out of me and the change is like the paddle hitting me. So um, again, that's a wonderful way to shock yourself out of it. Um, uh, there's also physical ways that you can do, uh, um, uh, get yourself out of it, which I, uh, which also can help. Now I have to tell you Friday, I had a day, I had a day and I was in the worst mood and Doug experienced most of it all day long. And he showed me this thing, which I'm going to share with the, the group, which I loved, which again, it's a physical um, change, but what he taught, what he told me was, okay, put your hand on your head, turn your head towards your right shoulder, and then look the opposite direction, look left. It's kind of stretching you. And by, you know, moving your eyes, it's kind of, you know, stimulating your brain to think, you know, in a different direction and then do it the other way, you know, bend head over. So if you want to try it, put your hand on your head, now turn your head towards your left look towards the right. And again, it's, it, it allows you just to look in a different direction and, and think differently. Um, and then the final thing I'll just say on the whole uh, mindfulness text techniques is nature. Nature is an amazing elixir. Um, I know, uh, Bill, I saw you, I think you did a Facebook post on, you went hiking and you saw amazing mushrooms and you had this whole compilation of mushrooms. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, a lot of times when Doug and I go to walk the dogs, um, I'll either be stressed or in a hurry and I just don't stop to notice nature. And so, uh, we started taking pictures of things that were really Wonderful. And one of the things that we've, we found was mushrooms and there's different varieties of mushrooms or flowers as they're blooming each day. And by doing that again, it, it was a, it was a trigger to just say, wow, enjoy this moment. So whatever the technique is, the second of my, my things for you is find something mindfulness wise that will help you. The third, uh, technique I want to um, offer is to watch for signs from God, from your guardian angels, um, from those looking out for you, because the signs are there if you, are rec if you will recognize them and understand that they're signs that are there. Um, I know that for most of my life, I missed a lot of those signs, but now that I'm becoming more, uh, I understand um, some spiritual techniques, I'm starting to understand them a lot more. Now, sometimes they're really, really subtle. It could be an, you know, an animal appearing suddenly um, or a, a call from someone out of the blue that you had just been thinking about. Um, I had something happen to me Wednesday. It was, one of, it was a much more overt sign, but it was just surprising to me how it just kind of number one happened this week when this was going to be my talk and then how amazing it shook me. So I was driving to Atlanta in the morning um, and uh, probably five years ago, uh, Doug and I had a house in Atlanta that we were renting and we finally sold it. We were thrilled and I was driving to the closing. And as I was driving down the road to the closing, there was a truck in front of me and a, a, a ladder fell off the truck. And luckily it didn't fall onto my car, but it fell on the road and I couldn't swerve to avoid it. And I hit it, it went under my car and I was just able to go off the road and get out of the car. Um, 
And, you know, obviously at that, I was just, you know, it was very, it shook me up. It was, it was, you know, it was a hard moment and, um, you know, kind of a lot went on, a lot of thoughts at that moment. So Wednesday, I'm driving to Atlanta. I'm driving down the road. I happen to be in the other lane. I'm not in the lane I was in when it happened. Um, and I'm near the spot that it happened. And there was a truck on the, in the other lane. And it had a wheelbarrow on it that was teetering. And I thought, is this a sign? And I tried to speed up to get the attention of the driver. Before I could get his attention, guess what happened? The wheelbarrow fell off and the car that was behind hit it. It went under their car and they went off the road. The, the truck went on and I could see that people behind me were um, uh, stopping to help the person, but I tried and he just kind of sped up and I tried to pull my camera out to get his license number to at least, you know, uh, make sure that he knew what was going on, but I lost him at a red light. But I thought after that happened, you know, I called Doug and I said, this was a complete sign that I need to wake up. I need to pay attention. And, and, you know, it was like God telling me that, that I can't repeat the same mistakes. You know, there's a lot of ways you can interpret this, but the way I felt was, gosh, I can't repeat the same mistakes. I need to listen to the signs. I need to, I need to really think about what my guardian angels are telling me. So that for me was a, an example of a, a, a huge thing, but the signs are often very subtle. And so I would just encourage you to watch out for them. Um, the next one I will say, number four on your list is um, uh, be around the good guys. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I was thinking about practice and after I had this run in with this uh, other actor, um, for several days, I was dreading going to practice. Now, I love drama. I love going to practice. The, the creative process when you put together a play is amazing. Um, but I was dreading it. I got to the point where I thought, oh, no, what's going to happen now? What's she going to do? What blah, blah, blah. And I didn't, I didn't stop to think about what is, um, what are the good people there doing? You know, there are people there that I love. And I was completely putting that aside and letting this one person dictate the, my thing. So I thought, you know what? Focus on the people there that I love. There's the, um, there's a woman named Lydia, she's got pink hair and she plays a German maid named Helga. And in the play, and I'm the, I'm the evil husband. Um, and the, the director keeps telling me, you've gotta be meaner, Craig, you've gotta be meaner, you're too nice, be mean. Um, but Helga, the German maid, and I don't like each other in the play. And she's constantly telling me off and I'm constantly ordering her around. We have the most fun. I totally forgot about that. Um, the, the minister at uh, the Highland United Methodist Church is in it. His name is Randy Lucas. He plays the eccentric neighbor Appleby, who is a total, total nutcase. And he is hilarious. He has all the comic relief. His lines are perfect. And they make me laugh every time I hear them, even though I've heard them a million times. And I forgot about the good guys. So just remember that the good guys are there. Don't be obsessed by that one bad apple in the bunch. Focus on the good apple uh, or focus on the good apples instead. Um, number five um, is uh, one that, uh, that, that often can escape us, which is remember that everyone's coming from a different place and um, you know, you, you never know what someone's going through because you can't walk in their shoes. And so a lot of times, if you can't have patience um, or understanding, you can have grace because people may be having a bad day. They may be having a background story that you have no idea. And they may just be rotten to you because they are just feeling 
awful. So if it's particularly if it's a first time thing, try to have grace in those moments rather than immediately jump to the conclusion that this is just a bad person. Now, if it happens over and over, that's a different thing. But a lot of times um, I know I'm guilty of someone does something to me and I just, oh, I don't like them. And then I stop to think, wow, maybe, maybe they're just having a hardship. Maybe this is just a bad time. Maybe I can try having more grace with that person. Um, now, having said that, number six is that there are certain people out there that I don't know if you've ever heard the term toxic people. Who's heard toxic people? Now, it's, a, it's an interesting phrase for me because I don't believe, you know, I kind of have that Anne Frank philosophy. I don't believe people are just inherently bad, um, but everyone has those people that are toxic to them right? You may not be, that person may be someone's best friend. You may see them cutting up and laughing with someone. They may be the most generous people with others, but for you, you just can't get along with them no matter what you do. You just can't. You, you've tried. Now, you can't use that excuse for everyone, right? Not everyone in the world can be a toxic person, but there are going to be those one or two people. And my best advice there is um, you have to figure out with toxic people how to endure. You're not gonna change them. You're not gonna make them different. Many times they're not gonna see your point of view, but you can endure. You can figure out ways to cope with the situation, to get through the situation and to um, uh, you know, honor that moment. We have a um, person that runs the Performing Arts Center that is that person for me. Uh, no matter what I say or do, I don't get along. Um, you know, I try to be nice and it's not met with an equal <laughs> response. And I have butted heads more times and I have just realized I will never, ever, ever get her to like me or, or, you know, understand my point of view. And that's okay. Not everyone has to like me. But every time I go into meeting, the first thing I say is, you just have to make it through this. Just be calm. Just take a breath. And when you make it through this, you will have succeeded. Even if you get nothing done, just make it through. And that's for me how I deal with those people. And you're going to have them, whether it's a boss, a family member, a, a colleague, whatever it is. So remember that Toxic people are not going to go away. It's your response to them that can change. Um, now, number seven, here is one that I am the worst at. This is the worst one for me of all time, which is remember to ask for help. Who gets in bad situations and thinks they can just solve it all themselves, that they can just, you know, they're going to fix it. I, I told you about Friday, and for the first kind of couple hours, I was just there and I'm going to fix this. I'm going to make everything right again. And poor Doug was trying everything he could to snap me out of it. Or, nope, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen until finally I asked for help. And, and um, it really is, uh, it is one of those things. It's a self-preservation instinct that many of us have to just make sure that we can protect ourselves. But, you know, one of the most, um, uh, I think, strong and courageous things that anyone can do is ask for help. It doesn't show weakness, which was what I was kind of, you know, I, I, I was kind of taught that throughout my life by a lot of my people I thought were my mentors was you need to be strong, you need to move forward, you need to be in charge. And instead, the best thing I could do was ask for help when I needed it. And it's just like on this play, when I start to see things falling apart, my first response is I got to go over there and fix it. That prop didn't work. Let me go find one online. Um, th this actor is having trouble. Let me be the one that helps them with their lines. I always feel that way. And so what I'm trying really hard to do is say, it's not my responsibility, right? My responsibility is to know my part and to get it right. 
And so, um, again, it's, it's something I'm really, really trying to do, not fix everything, but when I need help to ask for help. So that's my uh, takeaway number seven. Now, number eight um, is one that will bristle at, but sometimes you just have to look in the mirror and realize that you're that person every once in a while, right? We can all say we're perfect and everyone else is wrong, but sometimes we're that person. Now, talking about signs, um, uh, I mentioned the Randy Lucas at the Methodist Church. He puts out a daily reflection and as I was actually writing this, I was on my computer writing this and his reflection popped up on my computer. And it was this, it says, it's from uh, Thomas Akempis who wrote The Imitation of Christ. And the, the quote is this, try to be patient in dealing with the defects and infirmities of others, whatever they may be. Remember that you also have many failings which others must bear. Right as I was writing this, this popped up and I thought that has nothing to do with me. No, <laughs> anyway, um, no, but, um, you know, I, I did run into this a lot when, when we were doing this play because, you know, when I did my play and I did everything myself, I thought, well, I did this right. Why are they doing it wrong? And no, they're not doing it wrong. They're doing it their way. I'm not the, the be all and end all person. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've also learned, probably the hard way, is the best thing you can do is ask for feedback. The, the way to trigger this is to ask people. And I always try to do that. In fact, after my last talk I did here, I said to Doug, you know, tell me honestly, how did I do? What could I do better? Was it too long? Was it too short? Did I wave, wave my hands around too much? What did I do? And I'm trying to do that with the, the theater too. After every performance or every rehearsal, even if I think, oh yeah, I got that. That was perfect. I'll go up to the director and said, tell me, what can I do better? And we just don't do that. We just don't do that. It's a self-protection thing. Again, we put our armor on. We don't want to hear negative stuff. So ask for feedback. You know, it, it's a wonderful way to grow and evolve. Um, the next one, and here we are at nine, I'm getting closer to the end. Um, sometimes you have to realize that things are, for, for different people, they can be a game or, or drama, drama. Um, and you have to kind of think ahead a little bit. You know, when you play a game of chess and when you do a move, you kind of try to anticipate what your opponent is going to do. Or you remember Dallas, you know, before you sell the, shot, the, the shares to J.R. Ewing, you should think, what's he going to do? Is this going to come back and bite me? You know, you have to kind of anticipate. There's a lot of people out there that are like that. They have their motives. They have their ways of doing things. So it's, again, before you... Uh, respond before you do anything, think to yourself, what could their motivation be? What is it that they want to get out of this? And that may inform your choices on how you deal with them. All right. So the pre-thought, the pre-thinking about what other people motivate. And now I'm not saying that should change what you're doing, but I'm just saying it may give you a deeper understanding if you can help their, if you understand their motivation. Uh, number 10 is build up your reserves. And I think this is probably uh, the easiest one to say, but it's figure out what's going to fill your tank up. You know, when your tank is empty, what is it that's going to bring you joy? Is it, you know, you need to sleep more? Is it you need to do yoga with Ashley? Is it that you need to go for a walk? Is it that you need to read or take a bubble bath? What is it that's going to, um, create that moment of harmony and build up your reserves. Um, it is really so important. Um, and a lot of times I have crystals that really help me think about this. So today um, I brought a red jasper and the meaning of red jasper is that it absorbs negative energy and gives you resilience. So again, when dealing with drama, if you know you're going into a tough situation, take some red jasper with you so that it will absorb that and it'll let you get through more calmly. The other thing, if you're into aromatherapy, is peppermint. Peppermint, a, a whiff of peppermint is something that will 
turn your negative energy around. It's known for, you know, again, having that shock that will turn your negative energy around into a more positive space. So build up your reserves and sometimes little symbols like this can help you do that more. Um, number 11 is visualize a happy moment. Boy, I tell you what, that does more than anything. And I'm, again, I'll go back to Friday. It really is, talk about signs. So much happened to me this week that, that, that fed into this talk. And I had decided on this topic two weeks ago. Um, but when I was in the, in the middle of my mood, I picked up the phone and I texted Doug and I said, visualize us on a ship. And we hear the waves rolling and we have a deck out on the ship and we walk out to the deck together and we sit at the table and we play Scrabble because that's one of the things that brings us great joy. And as we're bringing, as we're playing Scrabble, we can feel the sun on our faces. There's a nice breeze blowing. The waiter has just brought us drinks. You know, just, it, you know, got more and more embellished. But again, that happy moment of visualization did so much for me right then. I thought, wow, I can feel myself there. I can feel the sun. I can feel the breeze. So visualize that happy moment. And, and now finally 12, I know you're probably thinking, is this going to ever end? But number 12, and I'll go back to where I started and where my last talk was, which is be authentic and celebrate yourself. No one is perfectly right. No one is perfectly wrong. We are all imperfectly us. And by being that, we are wonderful, special beings. Don't let others, don't let drama, don't let the bad things absorb the good things and the happiness that surrounds us. The happiness and the blessing of this moment where we could all be together here today. We've all gotten here safely. We're all experiencing this amazing spiritual moment. Let's all celebrate those moments because they're just joyous and it's so easy for us to miss. So um, that is your 12 step guide to dealing with drama, which is always going to happen. Um, and, um, you know, if I was to pick a 13th thing, I'll go again, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to music. Music is just a wonderful elixir. And boy, the times that I have just, you know, thought I was Ethel Merman and belted out Hello Dolly, or I thought I was a concert pianist playing a Rachmaninoff piano concerto, or even, you know, closing my eyes and listening to Kate Bush and imagine her standing there singing it to me. Um, the music is a wonderful place. So remember what Erasure said, um, your shame can be never ending if you perpetuate one psychological drama after another. So let's, don't let drama take you over. Be the director and the producer of your life. The actors and actresses are gonna come and go. Some are gonna treat you really well. Some are gonna treat you badly. Some will teach you really good lessons and some will just stand there with their hands on their hips and ask where their cucumber water is. But whatever it is, don't let that drama overcome you. Um, remember, always be who you are and don't be who they expect you to be. Thank you so much again for letting me be here.